It's going to come from Ms. Jamie McKinney. Um, first, thank you all so much um, for speaking here. I'm a mom here um, in Birmingham. Um, I actually have three questions. I'm going to ask just the, the first one. Um, so I'm a pediatrician. I'm here at UAB, and so I've been waiting to hear this, this discussion for some time. My first questions are to Mrs. Brown and Mrs. Madison. Um, I work with a lot of three- and four-year-olds who are too old for early intervention but have not yet been able to enroll in the schools um, yet. How, um, I think Ms. Madison first talked about the director of special education and kind of navigating this, but um, how do you best coordinate the three- to four, four-year-olds in, okay. in obtaining their so, care? First of all, um, the principles that apply when you're kindergarten on up, meaning comprehensive evaluations, I mean, IDEA stands for, and in the olden days we used to do, um, you identify your unique needs and then you're required, the district is required to give you a pro program to meet those unique needs comprehensively. That applies for three and four year olds also. Same law, same application. What happens in, in practice is that, um, God, I've got a lot of preschool, is that a parent will call me, for example, I'm, I'm going to see a new client on Monday and what she told me, it's a, th a three year old, almost four, was that she was the child was identified as having autism, and she is she has an IEP, but the IEP has her on a waiting list for a program that will hopefully she's been on a waiting list since April, that she's on a waiting list for a program that's supposed to start hopefully hopefully in the next two months. By law, I mean, that's just an illegal IEP. So you would, you would address, and I'm not answering it very well because, um, but I'll do better. Uh, what happens is you're a parent, you've got a, a, a child, you go to the school, they do an IEP for you. You're mostly not put on a waiting list. But what the district may say is, okay, we've got a preschool program, and it's at blah, blah school, and we'll see you Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8.30 until 10.30, and during that time, you'll get speech and language twice a week for 30 minutes and occupational therapy once, and the rest of it will be instruction. So, so that's what's being offered at many school districts. That's all that's being offered. The fact that that's all they have on site does not mean that's all you're entitled to. What you could, some school districts, it depends on where you are, more and more, are offering full day programs five days a week. And typically those have general ed kids, typical kids in them to serve as role models. So what, I guess my point is, is that when you're three, you're entitled to everything you need. And if you have autism, you probably need a four or five day program, a minimum of four hours a week that would also be um, attended by kids without disabilities. So what you would say to the district if they offered you, so parents, they don't know that they can say, mm -hmm. oh, I mean, they're three and four. The kids, this is brand new to the, to the parents. And they don't think there's anything else available. So um, my point is, is that because you're so young, the school district cannot give out, get out of giving you a, a, the program that you need because of that age. The other thing that happens typically in those cases, and I actually had one that uh, we ended up in court on, was the school district ran a preschool program for three and four year olds. And if you worked for that school district, your typical kid could come to that program and they were there five days a week from eight until three. Um, their special ed kids, however, were not allowed to come any more than 12 hours a week. And they rotated the special education kids. That's a denial of services based on disability, just like you couldn't say, okay, girls, you get to come 12 hours, boys, you can come you know, all day long, and so that's what a court found. But school districts, because they they have, because we're so far behind in the law on preschool, although the law has existed since the 90s, in fact, we're so used to doing so little for that group that some school districts just haven't caught up with it. And so 
those school districts that, that run the, that type of a program where the kids with disabilities come less, actually the schools, those school districts have thought that they're doing a really progressive role, and they are compared to the kids where you just show up with one or two or three kids for your 12 hours and there's no one else. Um, and what does the law say about summers? Are they required to provide these no. services during the summer? No, the, the law regarding extended year services is very, there's two ways you get summer school services or summer services. The law regarding extended year services is very stringent. And in order to get summer, uh, summer services, extended year services, you have to demonstrate, the district is supposed to keep data, um, and it's supposed to demonstrate via that data that the child regresses more than what can be typically recouped during the break periods. So it's only those children that really, really regress and it cannot be made up reasonably quickly that are entitled to uh, extended year services. Um, so the data is typically kept not over the summer only, but during Christmas break and during um, uh, like spring break or, or fall break. For some school districts with some kids, they'll do it over the weekend, uh, but that's, that's pretty unusual. So if, and there's no, there's no magic number. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a cookbook sort of analysis. I've found a couple of school districts this last school year that don't keep any data at all, and they just don't do extended year services. That's not an option. They're supposed to do data-driven services. Now, let me say this about that. By and large, and I litigated this, and like an idiot took the entire summer to litigate it, um, and so it, we didn't win, but had we won, there wouldn't have been a summer to get anything out of because the summer was gone. I mean, the hearings take days, oftentimes. But what the school district has to provide during the extended year services is minimal. And it's basically whatever the heck it is they have. And part of what the law looks at is the parent's ability to provide other summer services. My personal bias is that by and large, these extended year services are provided at the lowest, I'm gonna call this kind of the lowest common level of kids. In other words, it's all kids with disabilities. It's typically enrichment activities, and it typically is not aggressive programming for anybody, it's kind of the, the child who is the, quote, least, who, who the district has not helped that much or may have not particularly high levels of functioning at that point, that's kind of where all the programming is. So I'm not a huge proponent of it because it's not oftentimes worth fighting over. It's just one thing I'm gonna add when I get the phone calls in regards to preschool, I stress to parents, please stop waiting week after week to hear back from them follow up, have a timeline, ask who you are expected to hear from, by when, invest in a calendar and hold them to it. Send follow up emails and say my understanding is I will hear back from you because oftentimes for those waiting for preschool services, I say how long have you been waiting? Well, it's been two months and I haven't heard from anybody. That's way too long. They have, they by law are required to have an IEP in place at age three. And here's another thing. The district responsible, you do not have to be enrolled as a district, as a child. The district is responsible, this is for all kids, for identifying and evaluating all children within their jurisdiction, regardless of whether the child is enrolled in school, is in a private school, is in a daycare, they are still responsible for having an IEP offered to a child by the third birthday. It's a huge problem. Is that how you get around? I have a, a patient who's an, in private school, um, who, but who needs services, so I guess the district would absorb that. Well, it depends on what the child needs. The okay. parent, at a minimum, since the district hasn't reached out to them, and, and, and I'm not, you know, it is hard, I think, if I work for a school district to figure out where every preschool right. kid it was, but the district, at a minimum, should call the district and ask for an immediate evaluation. Um, and then do what you're saying in terms of following up. Uh, and so the district is responsible for providing an appropriate educational program. It depends on whether they have their own. It does not automatically mean that you're in the private school because the private school may not be offering special education services. Even if you're in Head Start, districts are required to come into Head Start and offer specialized instruction and the related services. Um, but the IEP will drive that but the parent needs to contact the school and get the process going. You finished, Dr. McKinney? Oh, okay, I'm not, I have one more question. Um, let's see, sorry. Uh, Dr. Houston, um, 
I have a lot of kids who um, have academic underachievement um, who have no formal diagnosis. This is like outside of autism. So this is just a question for you. Yes. Um, I have a lot of kids with academic underachievement um, who do not qualify for any ADHD diagnosis. Mm -hmm. How would you best navigate just kind of getting them plugged in somewhere or getting them assessed? Would you go straight to the, the testing or would you kind of, like, how would you... Yes, I would. If there are concerns, um, especially if there if there are parent concerns, and if you see that um, based on everything from their scores, from academics, that they are struggling, then yes, there needs to be um, the parents can initiate this referral. Um, you know, s stating that this is my concern. You know, that always in writing, as we've said before, you know, always in writing, but specifically say that my child is having difficulty in this area, this area, this area, and how it's impacting. Put it in writing and put it to the special education director. You know, also talk with the child's teacher, especially to have evidence as well, but go start investigating immediately. There's lots of unidentified kids, especially kids with ADA, lots of unidentified kids. I mean, I have parents that come to me in the ninth grade that say, you know, they're reading way below. Um, and so it, it's, it's not all that uncommon, and there's a lot of como comorbidity. It always sounds like such a bad word, uh, a horrifying word. Yeah, um, between ADHD and learning disabilities. I think it's like 80 or 85 percent. So yeah, parents can and should initiate evaluation. Service providers can. You can write a letter and ask that the child be evaluated. Thank you. Next question. First of all, thank you. Thank you so very much for putting this on. My daughter is 15, about to turn 16. And this has been a very trying journey. I am looking for help, a lot of help. Um, she has a 504 plan now, so she's tested out of the IEP, which I was happy yet not, because now we're in a private school due to education, um, I guess you would say uh, behavioral issues. So I need services from whoever at this particular point in time. Because like I said, she's, <clears throat> excuse me, she's 16, well, about to turn 16. And there has been some issues where um, attempted suicide, she's having a lot of bullying issues, a lot of social awkwardness, and the conversation about her being able to talk about chromosomes and all of that good stuff, she can do that. But talking to someone who's 15 or 16 years old, she doesn't do well at all. So um, what do I need to do is my question. And I probably have some more. I just needed to get that out. OK, so especially from, you know, I'm hearing this. And from the, the clinical mental health standpoint is that, you know, you need to speak with someone. And I'll be more than happy after just to talk with you in terms of about where to go next. But honestly, I always say, you know, you need to start looking at in terms of the evaluation and looking at recommendations. And I say that in terms of evaluating, that is going to give all the information that's needed for th then from there you can start looking at, you know, specific areas of where you need to go to get more assistance. But, you know, especially things like therapy, intensive types of therapy, you are talking about bullying. Um, I didn't even bring that up because that could be a whole day in terms of the level of bullying um, that our children, um, you know, that they have against them in the school setting and the tremendous amount of um, impact that they that that have on children as well. I have been doing in particular different counties different trainings related to that and how it causes actually 
PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, that it comes along with a variety of other different types of mental um, illness as well. And then it is not just something that can, you know, that is going to go away. This is in terms of lifelong types of things sometimes. So my first thing to you would be yes, to um, talk about, look into getting therapy, and then going um, from that aspect. Yes, okay. And so you say you're, she's in a private school at this point yes, in time? Yes, okay. ma'am, she is. Okay, and that, and again, I'll ask more specific questions. Just, I promise I'll talk with you afterwards. Okay, so, and the private school, because they're, they're really not under any obligation, are they providing any type of services at all? No, ma'am, they're not. Yes, okay. So then, um, talk to me afterwards, and then. Are they dis well? They're not. They don't have to provide any services. But are they a religious organization? They are. Okay. Do you have to belong to that religious institution to go to the school? No, ma'am. Okay. Then they're not legally considered to be religious organizations. So you're going to have Title Three of the ADA. So they couldn't exclude her from certain things. I mean, arguably they couldn't exclude her for certain things for behavior which was caused by her autism or by her disability. Um, they might have to do some some minor accommodations, um, but you're not entitled to like right. special education services. Would you consider putting the child your child back in the public school? It would honestly have to depend on where, yeah. because we pulled her out of Birmingham City because of the suicide attempt. The school that she sure. was in was the suicide attempt at. Yeah. So we pulled her out of Birmingham and pulled her into the private school, which that's where the socially awkward begins even more so now. Sure. Um, in relation to the to the social skills and things like that, you know, it's definitely important to get the therapy under and you know work on that mental health aspect and and things like that. But there, as a social worker, you know, we do I do know a bunch of resources in the area and types of. Um, other interventions that you could connect to, and one is something that we do at UAB um, that I'm part of is called the Peers Program. And I don't know if you're familiar with Peers, but it is um, basically a social skills intervention. And it has a, the, a teen approach and then a caregiver component as well. And the idea is to teach teens as young as 13 and as old as um, 18 to 21 how to make and keep friends. So they break down these very complicated social interactions that, that we kind of know as second nature and break them down into rule-based form, which is really beneficial for a lot of these teens that come through. And so we, we teach them things like, how, how do you trade information with someone and have that back and forth with a person? And then how do, you, how do you decide what a friend is? Well, it would be based on a common interest. So you can build that friendship based around that. And then you, we even target things like bullying. You know, you're bullied at school. How do you handle it? Um, what do you do? Um, we talk about that with our teens. And the goal is to get them engaged into a, um, a group, an extracurricular group activity, and to have friends that they connect with based on those common interests.